This morning we looked at Genesis chapter 12, and um, we saw there how Genesis 12 is God's announcement of blessing. So you get in the first 11 chapters. Of course, I, I didn't really talk about Noah this morning. Of course, in Noah you get this, uh, and God pronounces blessing on Noah, but um, the blessing on Noah then with, well, particularly with Ham and then the others, there's a renewal of curse. But overall, in those first 11 chapters, you have this sense that God's blessing has been lost. Uh, he made the world good. He pronounced it good. He blessed it. And then it's been lost. And, um, and then in chapter 12, God speaks again. Uh, the Lord had said to Abraham, he speaks again, and he speaks blessing, five-time repeated blessing, to emphasize that the five-time referenced curse in the first 11 chapters is now being overwritten, if you like, with God's majestic plan to bless all nations. And that plan to bless all nations begins to unfold in Genesis, and uh, you see this with Joseph. Joseph goes to Egypt, of course not um, the Israelite nation, he goes to Egypt. And from Egypt, he saves many lives, the Israelite people, but also the Egyptians and others. There's a beginning of this plan for blessing all nations through um, the people of Israel. In the story of Israel, they were a light to the nations. They were meant to be a light to the nations, a blessing for the nations. Um, with um, the story of Ruth, the Moabites being one example, Jonah, another example. Um, and then the fulfillment of that in Christ, and of course that's you know, a whole massive category there to fill out, but we looked this morning at Galatians chapter 3, how Paul um, references, and I just pull, pulled out one verse, but there's a long argument that he makes there that how that Abraham's, um, the, the Scripture, when it speaks of um, Abraham, uh, it references the uh, he, he references as the pre-preaching of the gospel to Abraham, that in him all nations will be blessed. And in Paul's argument, as he concludes in Galatians 3 verse 28, he concludes there that therefore there is now no, um, no slave nor free, no Jew nor Gentile, no male nor female, all are one in Christ. And so this blessing to Abraham, to all nations, is now fulfilled in Christ and received, in Paul's argument to Galatians, the point he's really trying to make there, it's received by faith, not by the works of the law, by faith. And so Abraham, who became, of course, Abraham later, is the um, father of faith. He's, he's the model of faith. This is what it's like to trust God. He hears God's word go, and he doesn't know where he's going to go, and he goes, and he trusts God. And because of that, he becomes a an example to us, the book of Hebrews describes it, him as the Abraham believed God and therefore obeyed. So we believe God and therefore we obey. And in particular, the fulfillment of this pre-preaching of the gospel to Abraham, we believe Christ. And therefore we receive the blessing that God announced in Genesis chapter 12, that blessing that is for all nations. And so we discussed that this morning, I preached that this morning. And uh, then we applied it particularly to the matter of uh, racism. So if God's plan is to bless all nations, and he does that through the gospel, then uh, the gospel is God's means for blessing all nations and therefore the antidote uh, to any kind of racism. And then we talked about it in terms of how that might apply in some practical ways. I, I shared some of the feelings I've had as I've been looking to it, which is a kind of righteous anger, the way that people down through human history, in America for sure, not just in America, in Britain as well, um, and uh, not just in, in European nations, but North Africa towards Europe back in the 16th, 17th centuries. Um, there's been this anti-blessing on all nations. The gospel is the antidote to, the, the antidote to. And my feeling of sort of, when you read the way that some people have been treated, it's hard not to end up feeling angry about that, especially when you realize that people have used the very word of God to give justification to racism. And so I shared that, and, but then I also shared uh, the importance of love, of listening and understanding, and then most of all, most of all, if the gospel is the power of God to bless all nations, then the primary 
and most significant way to deal with racism in our time is to preach the gospel to ourselves, to center upon the gospel in our churches, and to evangelize uh, the world around. So I've just summarized um, the sermon for you a little bit, and now I'm going to pray, and then you can ask questions, okay? So let's, let's pray together. Well, thank you so much uh, for the wonderful privilege it is. Uh, privilege is the wrong word, Lord. The wonderful grace it is to be among your people tonight. And I pray, Lord, that tonight would be a blessing for us and uh, therefore through us to many uh, peoples. I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to uh, center our thoughts upon your gospel, upon the word. I pray, Lord, that everything that is said and thought and done would uphold the image of God in all people. And, uh, Lord, that in Christ we are one. So I pray, Lord, that you lead and guide us by your Spirit. I pray you'd help me to give uh, answers that reflect your Word, and uh, we pray that all this would glorify you, most of all, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Um, so we are going to now have Q&A time, and we've got uh, three pastors. Josh is over here with the green microphone. Eric is in the middle with the red and John is uh, on the right with the yellow. And let me just give the rules of engagement again. And so um, keep your questions short. Don't um, um, sort of, don't make them a lecture. Make sure they are a question. Thank you. Um, you know, so we're here to ask, ask questions, not make a statement. So we're not, we're not looking for you to to lecture, but to, to ask a question. And um, so keep it brief, make sure it's a question. And the pastors will actually hold on to the microphone. And this is to um, continue to encourage everyone to ask brief questions. Okay, so now do feel free to ask questions. Just raise your hand, I'll try and pick you out in good order. And if no one has any questions, that's just fine. We'll pray and sing a hymn or something good like that. In an event entitled Race and the Christian in 2012, Keller outlines what he calls corporate responsibility for evil, seen as distinct from evil in strictly individualistic terms. He cites examples such as Joshua 7, Daniel 9, and Romans 5. Do you think the notion of corporate responsibility has a place in the Christian dialogue on race and do you think it might necessitate corporate restitution as part of corporate repentance? Uh, thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I watched that. Someone sent me that same video talk of Tim's. Uh, Tim is a hero of mine. I think he's a, a godly, godly man, greatly being used by the Lord in New York City. Um, Okay, so different parts to your question. First of all, it seems to me that um, I shall, where, which particular part of this knot string shall I pull on first? Um, it seems to me that there's no doubt that there is such a thing, just an experiential, experiential level as, well, the phrase that's usually used these days is systemic evil. Um, the trouble with using such a term like that is people have so many different ideas behind it. So sometimes, and this is, I listened to Tim's talk and I liked a lot of it and other parts of it, I mean, it was only 25 minutes, so if I, I'm sure if I was sitting down and talking with him, he would agree with what I was saying. Um, but the trouble with such a term like systemic evil is people put into that different um, philosophical ideas about how society works. So, if you're someone like Tim and obviously a Christian, you mean certain things by it. You mean Joshua 7 and the Bible verses and all that. Um, but that, that concept in our day is, in my understanding, my reading of it, the things like critical theory, uh, postmodern approaches to power, is invested with a whole set of you know, the, sh the academic shorthand for it is neo-Marxist, postmodern ways of looking at life. 
Um, and obviously, I don't buy into those, and nor does Tim, obviously. Um, but it does. So let me try and make it more practical. Okay. So I think that there has been a correct reaction in the church in the last 20 or so years to the tendency of Western Christianity to be too individualistic, right? Me my, my, and my God, you know, I make a decision, I don't need to go to church, we need, no, we need each other, we're part of the body of the Christ, we're a community, we're a covenant, we're, we're a family, that, that's a correct reaction. On the other hand, um, it seems in my observation that the Bible does also affirm my personal relationship with Jesus. I am made in the image of God. Um, I have a responsibility to serve Jesus. And one of the reasons why there is this concept of the individual, I think, in Western society is because of the Christian heritage, in particular because of the Protestant Christian heritage, you know, Martin Luther. I see this in Scripture. I, I'm actually going to stand against the great weight of... Now, you know, not, probably no one here is a Martin Luther, so we shouldn't all be standing up and saying, I'm right and everyone else is wrong. But uh, I think some of the... There's, there's been a correct reaction against individualism in the church, but there has been, I think, perhaps an overreaction. Um, so I have a responsibility. So this all goes to your question about, is there such a thing as systemic um, uh, patterns of evil? I think there's no doubt, of course. I mean, you just, it, it's most obvious to you when you go to a different culture. So when I uh, lived in, uh, for a little bit in, a, in one particular culture, uh, a nominally Christian, both former Soviet Union country, countries, you know, under an atheistic Marxist kind of regime. When you go to that place, you just see the patterns of, of control, of, of bribery and corruption. You see those patterns crystal clear. And then you come back to your own culture, and you be, your eyes begin to open. So for, I guess this is being recorded. Oh, well. But um, it, it, for instance, in, in my culture, in where I come from, in London, um, if you work in the city of London, which is the financial district, it really helps if you sound like me. Now, you don't know what that means, but I, I, I not only have an English accent, I have a certain kind of English accent. And I come from a certain kind of English background. And there's this sort of unwritten set of institutionals, inc institutional inclusions and exclusions that, you know, when you come back from the mission field, you suddenly go, oh, wow, this is all around here too. And there's no doubt there are these structures of, of there are these systems culturally. Um, I think... The, 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 the part where I struggle with some of that in that talk was the texts he's referring to are texts about the church. So the Southern Baptist Convention, I think it was in the mid-1990s, came out with a statement, a really well-nuanced statement, basically saying that they were corporately confessing that in their history, now this is, they're looking back 100 years, but in their history, there have been people who have been called Southern Baptists who had preached racism, and they were publicly distancing themselves from that. I think there is a place for the church to do that. Um, but I wouldn't want to so talk about corporate responsibility that there isn't also an individual responsibility. And so every time I say that, you know, yeah, there are, there are systems of evil. But on the other hand, there's individual... Um, I am made in the image of God, and, and I must choose this day whom I serve, and that's up to me. So it's, I, I guess, okay, I've talked around, I think it's more balanced than that. Does that help? And I, I don't want to so much talk about systems that in the end, I'm, it's like a Trojan horse to let in all this postmodern neo-Marxist stuff that I was kind of trained on in the, in the 90s so I can smell, and it's in there. 
Um, whereas in the Christian worldview, there's, yeah, there's corporate, community, God's people, but there's also, I have a relationship with God, and those are much more nuanced and balanced. So I hope I've answered. Now no one else will want to ask another question because that was far too complicated. Sorry, I did my best. There's one down the front here. I think John's coming. <laughs> See, this is, cute. this is corporate responsibility right there and then. Last time I held, uh, held this and he tried to get it away from me. Because uh, it was too long. <laughs> he won't let me have it. Anyway, I, we never really discussed the definition of race. Mm. Now, you, you came close when you said that there were times when uh, you were asked uh, in, a, in a form, are you uh, African American, are you this, are you that, and you write human being. Mm -hmm. uh, I agree with that. I think, we, I think there's one race. But apparently the world thinks that race is divided into col skin color, basically. And I'm wondering what the Bible really says about, is, for example, an, a person with black skin different in race than a person with white skin? Mm -hmm. So I, I think we really need to define what race is uh, from that point of view, because I, I kind of agree. I always say human. Yeah. Well, I, you're right, that's a very important point. I didn't spend a lot of time trying to develop that, but you've, you've, you've picked up what I think, uh, which is th that, and even outside of, um, which is agreeing with what you're saying, even outside of Christian circles, in academic um, circles, or people who study this, increasingly they're not, because of the genetic data, which I referenced this morning, about 99%, and it's more than that, actually. So it's 99% the same, but in that 1% of difference, you get something like, something like 75% is similar, and of the 35% of the 1%, you get things like skin color, but then you also get things like lactose intolerant and, and other things. This is a minuscule part of the physicality of the difference. And so people tend to talk about not so much racial differences as a person of European descent. In other words, what they're talking about is geographical and cultural heritage rather than fundamental difference. And I think that's a better way to look at it. So there are points of origin, there are cultural differences, there are environmental things that affect us over hundreds and thousands of years, but we're not fundamentally different. No, we're... So you get the table of nations in Genesis uh, chapter 10, that comes out of Noah, so you get these different families that stem all from, in the end, from Adam, but they're different families of the same root. There's not a fundamental difference. Yeah. We've got a question uh, in the middle. My eyesight is terrible and getting worse. Read too much Jonathan Edwards manuscripts, so I can hardly see anymore, but yeah, there we go. Um, in your first lecture, you uh, did a great job and made a great sermon. Decision. Sermon, sermon, sermon. Sermon. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, you made a great distinction between biblical justice and social justice, and yeah. it was very helpful to understand the, those nuances in, in that. Um, do you see similarities between the current cultural definition and discussion of race? and the postmodern social justice movement? Yeah, I, I do. Uh, but I had a deliberate strategy on this. So when I was critiquing some of the conversation, I wanted to do that at a general level when I was talking about social justice. It's really hard to do the same thing when you're preaching about the gospel's blessing to all nations because at that point I start talking about, well, there's this Trojan horse of neo-Marxist post-modernity in some of the language that people talk about here, and that's dangerous because it assumes that people are good when really we're sinners, and what we need is saving, not simply, not, not simply cultural or environmental change. There's a hard issue, and so we, we, but if you do that when you're, when you're, you're, if you mostly do that when you're preaching about such a, such a, it's hard to do that at the same time when you're preaching about God's blessing for all nations because you'll just be heard as not caring. 
And the more I read about uh, slavery, segregation, the new Jim Crow, some of those sort of things that are out there, um, uh, a memoir of one of the leaders, the Black Lives Matter thing, um, the more I read about that, the more I just heard pain. These are people, and I, I didn't agree with all their conclusions by any means, but what they needed to hear from someone that, that is that God loves them and that there's a, has a compassion for the situation and a blessing. That, that was the fundamental thing I felt most important to communicate. But I agree with you, there are those kind of issues, and that's why I did it at a generic, at a more general level, one step back when I was talking about social justice stuff. Because that applies to poverty and all sorts of other things as well. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. It's a very, you know, you're going to be on both sides of this issue. And it's so how do you bridge that gap when, you know, when immediately, um, you know, in today's culture, if you're a white man, you're racist. Yeah. If, um, yeah, and I didn't if really... you don't believe fully, if you're not fully aligned with some of the social justice, you're a racist. Yeah. So how do you bridge that gap? in today's culture. Um. Yeah, and I didn't talk about that either. Um, I think a lot of this comes down to the personal level. So that's why I landed when I was preaching this morning about go out and meet a refugee and get to know them, make a friend. Um, because a lot of these things are cultural misunderstandings. So uh, in what I have found, I was given one very good piece of advice when I was on the mission field and really struggling to make a connection. And the advice I was given was and we need to pray that the Lord will find you one friend of that culture. That, 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 that then through that heart connection of that person, you will then have an understanding of that culture you're trying to reach. And I have found that to be true time and time again, that when you make that personal connection with an individual, or maybe two or three, but certainly one, then the Lord opens up a whole a group of of, of, um, of connectivity between, those, uh, between, between that barrier. I th certainly think it's untrue that every white person is a racist. This is ridiculous. I mean, there's all sorts of racists. There are, there are, you read this, in, when you read about the, uh, in, quite deeply in the literature, you find that everyone knows that's untrue, really. I mean, it's not as if the only racial issues are between black and white. I mean, that's ridiculous. I mean, you've got, you know, um, there are fairly major racial issues between African Americans and Jews in Boston, for instance. I mean, there'd be murders. I mean, this is, you know, so that's just far too simplistic. And get outside of America. And in, in Britain, it's between English and Pakistani in some parts of the country. And, and then in, in, in the Republic of Georgia, in the former Soviet Union, it's between Georgians and Russians. And Russians, and Ge Russians always think that Georgians are terrorists. And, and Georgians always think that Russians are imperialistic. And so there's all sorts of these kind of things. So it's, it's absurd to say that if you're white, you're therefore a racist. I mean, I would... You know, I, you, 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 you want to be able to get to a point where you can call someone out on that, but I think a lot of it's a personal level. So you get to know the person, and they get to know you, and then you start to build a bridge that way. Okay, we've got, I hope that helped. We've got some other questions. There's one in the middle there, John. Um, Pastor Moody, do you yeah. think that raising, in that discussion that you're just having with that person, um, with those differences and their assuming this definition of race, trying to get them to see the difference between the cultural differences versus race is you have to listen a long time yeah. before you can really bring that up though and interject the possibility of, of cultural respect and differences is that oh yeah I, I, it certainly should be in the dialogue at some point for sure um, and that goes back to the question about um, and this isn't then a sort of evangelical little minor minority report thing. Again, when you look at the people who look at um, 
you know, how we're genetically wired and therefore how you discuss different uh, nationalities in the world. They won't talk about fundamental differences. They'll talk about people of cultural, linguistic, and geographical origins. So you've got cultural, you've got language, the kind of language you use, you've got where you come from. All those things influence the mind and how you act, and so that's all got to be in the room when you're trying to understand someone. It, and the, the, the sort of way you look on the outside is a pretty minor part of it, really. Um, and again, you can see that when you travel. So, you know, you get people of African descent in one part of the world who act one kind of way, and you people of African descent in another part of the world who act quite a different kind of way because they've got different cultural her heritages. Um, So, uh, yeah, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't start there. You can feel in the room it's even quite a difficult thing to say, even though we're friends, we know each other. I wouldn't start there. Yeah. Uh, we got a question here for this gentleman here, and then we got uh, a lady at the back there on the left, maybe this guy here. Um, if I could have a moment, I don't, I don't know if I have a question, but I think I, can, I do have an answer. Well, we, we're here for questions. I, with my background, I think I have an important answer for the congregation because as a teacher, I had to go to a two-day training on white privilege and white racism and it's, it'll, it'll be sh very short. Okay. Um, it is a political and economic cause that we are facing with the, you know, like the one man said about racism, uh, how were the races? It was political and economical. And then back here, he said, what, what, what can we do about it? Simple interactions break down these barriers. So I think mm -hmm. going, that's the right, right step. I listened to your sermon today. The answer is the gospel, so I totally agree with you. Unfortunately, um, culturally, our country is saying this, and, and the political people that want to say it's racism of the past who's causing this problem, but it's actually the lack of the gospel in these communities, mm. which is causing these, these issues. Yeah. Um, Sunday is by far the most segregated day of the week? Uh, that would be a question. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I, um, I know that's the famous Billy Graham quotation. So, you know, disagreeing with Billy Graham is like disagreeing with the Pope in Roman Catholicism. So I guess it must be true. I, I, um, yeah, it probably is. Um, but but the, again, you see, this is why I'm a bit of an alien. Maybe that is true in America. I don't know, maybe, I think it's probably less true than what it was first said in the 50s. Um, there's been, you know, like my friend Brian Loritz has done a whole bunch of um, multi-cultural uh, ethnic churches, and it, there's a big movement of that. I think it's going less true, less true in the inner cities because of the um, revitalization of inner cities and so in some areas. So you get these uh, multicultural uh, churches, the church revi the revitalization that I did in New, New Haven when we were there, uh, there were, when I first started, there were 20 or 30, I've told this story to the congregation, you may or may not have been there when, you, when I did, but uh, when we first started, there were 20 or 30 people there, and, um, and it really was 20 or 30, because one of those families was an African-American woman with 10 children, and it was 20 or 30, and she had 10 children. And we were always pretty diverse, but we didn't no one would have said, that's a diverse church. We just preached the gospel, and we knew each other, and people came along. Um, so, yes, but in my personal experience, less yes than perhaps elsewhere. Okay. Um, just a quick follow-up. Um, so, one of the problems we're having, and if you want to reach people, you have to have the data. And our culture only gives us the data from one side mm -hmm. of the aisle. Uh, because, unfortunately, it's political and economical. So there are a number of scholars, Thomas Sowell, Walter Williams, Shelby Seal, these type of people, I think, 
more Americans need to know. They've been hidden from many Americans because right. the data supports their conclusions over these other people we feel are more race hustlers, yep. I would say. I think it's really good. And I, you, 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 I think you're leading to that because of the, the solution being the gospel and then the, the, in those communities. And that's, um, so this is just one experience, but it's experience that has, that has shaped how I look at life and has been confirmed when I look at the Bible. It's, it's like, oh, that's, that makes sense of what I saw. Which is, um, so I used to live in an area that was, uh, um, really was the hood. And we, and I would cycle my um, bicycle through the hood wearing a bow tie. And everyone thought it was, uh, you know, I guess, I don't know, they thought I was ridiculous and running after me, there's a guy with a bow tie, you know. But I was fine, never felt any danger, it was, you know, I lived there, it was my neighborhood. Um, and I, I noticed, um, uh, you know, a lot of uh, programs of one kind or another, a lot of good works going on of various um, things. And then I remember one Wednesday cycling past a church. And then it was after the prayer meeting, I guess. And out of the church just spilled families and individuals carrying Bibles with big smiles on their face. And it was like just light just spilled onto the streets from the church. And I really think it is the gospel that is the solution. I really do. Which doesn't mean we don't need to do things, but that is the core issue. It comes down to core heart things. Thank you. That was, that was, that was definitely a question and a helpful contribution, so thank you for doing it. Yeah. Got a question here from Anita and then a lady with white hair at the back. Oh, no, we don't? Okay. Anita. I'm in a bind because... <laughs> It's not entirely a question. It's the answer to Elliot's thing. You, oh. would, you, would, you, would you like to read it? <laughs> That's my question. Or should I just read it? You can read it, Anissa. It's okay. okay. This is from Paul's sermon in Athens you know, with the unknown God. Uh -huh. And he gives the answer. Oh, yeah. That's a great question. He yeah. has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face yeah. of the earth. Which means you are my cousin. You are my cousin. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Thank you, Anita. Good. Uh, I have a question about culture, but before that I would like to read uh, two verses from the Bible. Mm -hmm. It's Psalm uh, 45, 10. Hear, O daughter, and consider, and incline your ear. Forget your people in your father's house, and the king will desire your beauty. Since he is your lord, bow to him. Mm. Uh, my question is uh, about culture. Is, it, um, is concept of culture equals to uh, concept of world? In other words, is the culture godly or worldly? when are we supposed to keep it and when we are supposed to discard it? Mm. And um, when uh, we cannot be taught by the culture, I believe, how to worship God. Our worship to God can be based only on the Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, is American church exclusion of that mm -hmm. or no? Yeah, uh, so, you. yeah, thank you so much. So, um, uh, the word culture is used in quite different ways, sometimes sort of sliding into each other without people realizing they're using it in different ways. So, anthropologists, people who talk a lot about culture, would say everything has a culture. What they mean by that, so your, your family has a culture, um, Starbucks has a culture. Different churches have different cultures. Um, and the things that influence culture would be um, the kind of um, color you use on the walls, the kind of carpet you have, um, the, the language you use, not, not just whether you're speaking this language or that language, but whether you use long words or short words, whether you reference literature or science, all that formulates a set of things that are the culture. 
So that's how a lot of people use the word culture, right? Um, often in Christian circles, um, culture is used as equivalent to the world. You know, there's the church, and then there's the culture, right? So these are um, terminological differences. You've just got to know how the word is being used in the conversation to be able to answer the question when you say, what about the culture, right? So to come to your last question, should, should um, a church get how it worships God from the Bible, from the culture? Well, I, I mean, I think you know what I think about that, which is you get it from the Bible. If you mean culture in terms of the world, we don't want to be governed by you know, what the world tells us to do. We, we worship God according to the scriptures. Um, in Presbyterian history, it's called the regulative principle. So you, you, you regulate the worship of God according to Paul's teaching, and particularly First and Second Timothy, Titus. And that's how, you, that's how you worship. So thanks for that question. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, the gospel is the solution to racism. Huh. That's what you said earlier. The gospel um, tells me that I am forgiven for my mm. sins. Because I'm forgiven for my sins, I then need to be a forgiving person. How can we promote the conversation of racism and forgiveness? Hmm. Wow, that's a great question. Um, I love how you put that together. Well, I think it begins with humility, which begins with what you said about if, if the gospel is the center of things, then it means that I'm a forgiven person. And if I realize that I am a forgiven person, then, uh, then I'm less likely to tell, take a self-righteous attitude to another race or another person because what do I have to offer? What have I got that God was? You got a follow-up question? The role in the offended person forgiving. The role in the offended person? Uh, huh. um, yeah, that's hard, isn't it? When... What I tend to say to people when they... Um, are wrestling with forgiving someone is I sort of have two conversation points in my mind, right? So the first conversation point is we, we as Christians forgive someone not because the person deserves to be forgiven, not because they do certain things that prove they deserve to be forgiven, you know, have they repented enough kind of thing, but because we've been forgiven. And so Jesus' parable about the, um, the unmerciful servant, that's what it's showing us, you know, that, 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 that the master forgave the servant this huge amount of money, and then the servant went out and found someone who owed him real pittance, and then shoved him into jail because he wouldn't pay him back. And, of course, the point is, Jesus is, is making there, is you should forgive someone who's done something really relatively minor against you, not because they... Not because they haven't, not because that wasn't wrong. If you're forgiving someone, by definition, they've done something wrong. But because of all this, you know, the, the wrath of God that we all deserve, uh, eternity in hell that we have been forgiven, therefore we forgive. So that, that then puts the onus not on... Um, so the way I formulate it is, now, whether then you can enter into an intimate friendship relationship with that person, that becomes a reconciliation process. So you forgive someone because God has forgiven you. Well, and that begins the ability to reconcile with someone. But you know, if you're talking to someone who's a battered wife or something, well, they've got to forgive their husband. But it may not be a safe place for them to be back home. Perhaps one day it will be, but not now. And so there has to be then a process of, of reconciliation where the, where the person who is offended rather than the offender needs to develop a pattern of behavior whereby th that person goes, okay, now that's something I can trust again, right? So that becomes a process, but that's reconciliation rather than forgiveness. So there's that forgiveness, that reconciliation then process. The other thing I say about the pure forgiveness thing is 
I, I think that we as Christians are called to forgive. And we just need to say to the Lord, I forgive that person. And you need to say to that person, I forgive you. But then what I find is very often, because I was hurt, the offense or the pain kind of comes up again. And then when it comes up again, I need to forgive the person again and again and again. And sometimes it goes on for a long, long while until one day I wake up and go, oh, I really have forgiven that person. So I think that does apply beautifully to the issues of... So the concern, one of the concerns the brother asked us about systemic and all that, one of the concerns is that this forgiveness thing isn't enough at work in that, that whole world, which again is why the gospel is the answer. And that's a great way of applying it. Thank you, Elaine. Um, we've got some other questions. There's one back here, or maybe two back there, or one. Um, my question is a little bit more general, not just racism. But throughout the history, uh, people have been quoting Bible to support various wrong theories, like heliocentric theories, and then up to in, uh, slavery and, uh, mm. and, and racism, for sure. So my question is, as an individual, as a church, mm. how, how can we be sure that we are not making the same kind of mistake by quoting God's word wrongfully? Mm. Great question. Um, So the heliocentric thing, yeah. Um, the, the answer I would have to that uh, at one level is quite simple and the other level I think is really quite complicated. So let me just start with the simple one then maybe I'll allude to the complicated one and then perhaps you and I can talk more about it afterwards okay, if I don't say enough now because it, it could go on for a long while, right? The simple one is I really do think it comes down to actually looking at what the Bible says, which is why when I did this series, I made a decision in my preparation to actually spend a lot of time in an individual text that I knew had reference. I mean, there are a lot of texts I could have referenced about racism, right? I mean, Galatians, for instance, and I, you know, um, would have been obvious with uh, Paul rebuking Peter for not acting in line with the gospel, that, that sort of thing. There have been many others. Um, but I decided it would be to find the, the sort of uh, spring, the, the, the root of this, the gospel being the blessing of all nations in, in Genesis 12, and then really seek to understand it carefully. So I really understood what it was saying in its original context, and then apply it. Because, for this very reason you're bringing up, because I think the history of the church shows that when the church does that, it can speak with authority and it gets it right. But when the church relies upon tradition or what we have always said, then it tends to get into difficulty. So with the you know, Galileo, Copernicus thing, what's fascinating about this, because one point I had a, um, a lot of wonderings about the same kind of issue, what's fascinating about that is actually the, um, uh, not that the Protestant reformers didn't get other things wrong, they did, uh, but, but on this particular issue, the Protestant ref reformers, uh, one of the issues with Galileo was that he was, because he took that view, um, he was viewed as potentially heretical because the Reformation movement was taking the Copernican view, or at least was open to it, because, because they were actually having their, their nose in the Bible and realizing that there were things that the Bible did and didn't say, and, right? And it was the Roman, the, the, those who were holding on to traditional interpretations that got in trouble. So what that means, I think, is very practically, and this is all the sort of simple thing that I've alluded to some of the complexity, very practically, I think it is extremely important that churches have Bibles open, look into the Bible. We won't always get it right. But if we've got the Bible open and we, we have conversations about the Bible, we have small groups in the Bible, the Bible's preached, what that does is it, it, it corrects people from people like me and you from getting on their hobby horse and preaching what they think is right rather than, oh, wow, that's what it really means. I've never seen that before. And that's got to change how I think about this. And, and does, does that help? And you can see there's a whole complexity about that because of the way that works out hermeneutically how you interpret scripture, but I think it really does come down to actually having the Bible functionally at the heart of what we do and digging into the text itself in its context 
So we know uh, in Simeon Trust terminology, which is an organization that college churches had a lot of involvement with, we neither go above the line to interpret uh, legalistically, nor under the line to interpret liberally, if you like, too liberally, but we stay on the line of Scripture, and that requires hard work, prayerful, spirit-filled hard work. And functionally, then, we just got to have the Bible often, you know, always at the center of church life, and then it will guard us against making too many mistakes for too long. Does that help? Thank you. Yeah. Um, that's two weeks ago, you talked about social justice, and mm. um, one of my children attends a very renowned religious institution that has more of a liberal slant to it, and the social justice in relationship to race, and the question I have is white privilege. This is the first time we've had to face the white privilege question, and she's struggling with that in that context at a college setting. Where's the biblical response to that that she can give? Yeah. Um, a biblical response? Um, So I would start with retelling the story of the gospel. We're all made in the image of God. Uh, we're all sinners. Uh, there's only one way to be saved, that's through faith in Christ. Having been saved, we now to need to um, work out our salvation with fear and trembling, to repent of any known sins, to be salt and light in the world, to become more and more the people of God for His own possession, that we might hold forth the word of life to His glory, to have an impact in the world around us, and then be His people in His possession forever and eternity. So that, that one, one of the challenges, I think, with this whole narrative the, the white privilege narrative, is that the narrative we want to tell, that story, gets marginalized. So there's another story, which would be, how would it go? Um, because, well, fundamentally, because we're all by nature good, but that, that gets even f further down. Be because certain groups have grabbed more power than other groups, they are endemically and intrinsically the wrong. So it goes back to my thing. Do you remember, the, did I ever do the um, postmodern fourfold uh, proposition thing? Were you around when I did that? So the, the postmodern fourfold proposition, I think, is something like this. Um, number one, see if I can get it right. Uh, number one, uh, there is no absolute truth, right? Uh, number two, Therefore, any claim to absolute truth is only a power move. Number three, therefore the world is divided between oppressors and the oppressed. Number four, therefore you cannot deny the experience of the oppressed, for if you do, you're only adding to their oppression. So the, the white privilege thing is, is a kind of critical theory expression that is playing around with numbers three and four, but really is built upon numbers one and two, which is why you need to, I think, go back to the narrative of the gospel. So for someone like that, I say, look, let's look, into the, let's look at um, uh, the, the Acts story, you know, Acts 17, or the, the Sermon to Athens, or something like that. Let's look at how the Bible puts together the story of humanity, right? Um, is it true that... Um, some white people have been racist. Well, of course. Is it therefore true that anyone with white skin is intrinsically racist? No, that would be absurd. I mean, do you, do, Saudi Arabia does not have a problem of white privilege, right? There aren't that many white people there, you know? And, and so it's, it's, it's not a hugely sophisticated, it's too simplistic. For the real issue is that we're actually all fallen, and there can be uh, bigotry, prejudice on all different sides. 
And so you, you don't want, to, with this narrative, you get to a place where certain people are in a privileged kind of situation as being endemically righteous because, well, and this because they have been oppressed, and other people are not because they have so-called been the oppressors. That's not how the Bible puts the story together at all. And, and so it really comes down to first principles. So you, it's going to take a while to unravel that. That doesn't mean, however, and this is what makes it so difficult, that doesn't mean, however, that, you know, I mean, I was just having, someone was texting me or was they emailing me this afternoon about experiences they've had of African-American people in the workplace who've been passed over for promotion because I mentioned that this morning. Of course that happens. I'm, I'm sure it happens. Is that wrong? Yes. Uh, could it be a white privileged thing? Maybe, but I wouldn't put it like that. Because I think once you put it like that, you're playing into this other narrative. And I want to I wanna put forward the gospel narrative. Does that make sense? Am I helping? Somewhat. You've been very kind. Okay. Dawn will help us immensely with a well-expressed question that makes a very good point. In that same regard, when you think about it, how do we, I mean, I think we all can have blinders and prejudices and that we are not aware of yeah. and we're interacting with other people. What practical ideas do you oh. have for helping us to become aware of our blind spots? Yeah, thank you, that's brilliant. I w uh, so I've got a little list in my mind. I would say number one, read. Read books by people who aren't in your club. So I read Cornell West, Race Matters. I don't think he's in my club. I don't agree with everything he says. I learned a lot, you know, uh, that's okay. So um, I wouldn't give that to a new Christian to disciple them how to read the Bible, but I learned a lot, right? Um, so read stuff, uh, read widely, number one. Number two, make friends of people who are different. Listen carefully. When you, have, when you have a friendship, you get a heart connection, and that helps you, you sort of taste things through how they would feel. You walk in a room, and you're thinking, how would John feel at this moment? And you can just sort of feel it. And it becomes a part of you, and it's really love, isn't it? That you, you, so there's, a, there's a, the, 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 the friendship, the filios love. Um, number three, I don't think it's possible for everyone, but I think it really helps if you can travel. If you can, if you, whether it's a stamp mission trip or some other work opportunity, if you can get out of the country, go to a different country where they look at life very differently, and if you have the opportunity to live somewhere else, hugely helpful. Your blind spots begin to go off. Um, uh, disabilities ministries, I actually think it helps to see life through someone who isn't part of the privileged class, and that certainly isn't a racial issue. And you begin to see it's, they're, they're, it's far more complicated, and the Bible story actually begins to be deeper rather than more simplistic than this other story. Thank you, that's a great question. How are we doing for time? We have something like two minutes or something like that. Oh, I'm happily pray. We got one more question here. Uh, it's a new phenomenon. I don't know if you know about it. It's this uh, DNA studies that are going on. Have you had yours checked? No, I haven't. <laughs> you, you really ought to. <laughs> <laughs> You're probably right. We did it with my with uh, two of our children, but yeah, not with well. Me. It, it's an interesting thing because racism is all about, you know, to me, it's about one person looking at another person not liking his skin color or something and making a judgment. But this gets really down to it because it's, really, it's kind of affected my family in that my wife uh, has found out all kinds of things about herself, you know. Gee, I didn't know I had this much Scottish in me or yeah. I, I didn't realize that I was this much uh, British like John here, or, or our pastor, you know? I said, well, uh, hey, that's a problem. But, uh, <laughs> but, but anyway, any, anyway, I don't, I don't know whether this is gonna help this whole business of, so, yeah. of us yeah. looking at each other, mm -hmm. or, or, gonna, or gonna help it or hurt it. What do, what do you think about that? I think it should help it, because, you know, it, it, there, there are cultural and historic and linguistic and geographical uh, lineage distinctions, there are, but I think that, that should help. 
um, because it goes back to being made in the image of God. It's an illustration or some data about that from one little perspective. We're made in the image of God, all of us. The biggest help, again, is the gospel. So in other words, as Christians in Christ, we know we're in Christ, we've received the gospel through nothing we've done, therefore we relate to other people with a sense of humility, therefore we're able to forgive other people, and we become agents of that kind of love and truth that the world so desperately needs. And this is our, our calling as a church, to be like that in our homes and in our families. I'm going to pray, and then we'll go on our way. So let's pray together. Our Lord God, we bow before you. I pray, Lord, if anything that has been offensive uh, this evening other than uh, the gospel, I pray that you'd remove that. Any stumbling blocks other than the cross, I pray you'd remove from our minds and hearts. Would you bind us together in this room with cords of gospel love? And we do pray, Lord, for those who have experienced great pain. We pray, Lord, that we would be a help. And we pray, Lord, uh, for uh, the church in America and uh, the world, the outside culture in America. We pray, Lord, that the, the, the biblical gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, would prevail with great power. And we pray this in Jesus' name for his glory. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. You are dismissed.